Lord, I just thank you for your word. I thank you that it encourages us and challenges us and transforms us. And I pray that it do so today. And we just give you praise. We want to receive. Just tell the Lord, I want to receive what you have for me today. Just we open our hearts to receive and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I'd like to thank Joanna again for sharing last week. That was a great word. Woohoo! Our authority is in our obedience. If you didn't see it last week, check it out. It's on YouTube. Just go to the website, and you can check it out. And we've been talking about uh, revival, and a, and a movement of God is when the church gets revived and the world awakens. And that's what we're believing for, amen? Believing for it in this place, and we're already, like, on our way. That's what I really believe. I believe we are on our way. We are reviving we are reviving, and, and we, we, we're talking about some of the different ingredients. One of them is awe. Just when, whether it comes first or comes during or whatever, I don't know, but we're in revival when we are in awe of how amazing our God is. If we don't have awe, I'll just tell you, we don't have revival. Like, if we're used to it, we're like, mm, yeah. It's like, like, when I first got married, people would be like, they, they're like, oh, just wait till the honeymoon's over. Because I'm all like, yeah, this is amazing, right? And they say, just wait till the honeymoon. You ever hear anyone say that? Well, you know what I've seen? I've seen old people that were like married 50 years. No offense to any, like, if you're like, well, I've been married 50 years. You called me old. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. So, sorry. <laughs> but... But I see <laughs> Gary's like, hey, I'm watching you. You can see me from here? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Just messing. Just messing. Sorry. Losing track. Losing track. So, but I've seen people that have been married 50 years who are still in love. Yeah. And still like, wow. I still think my wife is, woo, this beautiful lady. Wow. Amen. Well, it's because she is, right? I'm still like, wow. Right? And so, you know what? If that can happen in the natural I think it can happen with the God of the universe, who is always amazing. One of the first things that the Lord spoke to me when I heard his voice when I became a believer was he said, emotions come and go, but I am always the same. And what he was telling me was that even when I don't feel it, he's still amazing. The only thing that changed was me. So we can go back to this place of awe and every revival. Every person that is on fire for Jesus, everyone that is walking in personal revival is in awe of the God we serve. Amen? And last time we talked about uh, every revival, every awakening has a hunger for God's word. Just this like insatiable hunger like, you know what? This amazing, wonderful God, I want to see what he says. Right? And we talked about Josiah, and Josiah was, I just love the story because they're like cleaning, they're, they're like rehabbing the temple, and they discover this old book. It was probably Deuteronomy, and they're like, what's this? Dust it off, and they start reading it, and he read it to the people, and they're like, oh, we got to do this. And they experienced revival because of that, and it was amazing. And see, the, the word of God is powerful. Hebrews says, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The Bible is God's word, and it is powerful. And I told you, I had a friend who was robbing cars, who was breaking into cars, and he broke into a car, and he's like, what the heck is this? Like, taking the stereo, and then he sees this, like, leather-looking book. And his friend's like, oh, that's a Bible. And he's like, I guess I'll steal that, too. <laughs> and he started reading it, and his friend is, like, this backslidden Christian. And then he's, like, asking his backslidden friend some questions and stuff. My friend got born again from reading the Bible. <laughs> and I did. I was like, well, did you ever give it back to the person? And he's like... And repent, and he's like, well, no, it's, it's too sentimental to me now. <laughs> but you know what? It gives me hope for, like, you ever have, like, something bad happen, and you pray for that person that, like, robbed you or something? You're like, well, Lord, save them. Well, like, that actually happens sometimes. 
<laughs> That's pretty cool when they steal your Bible. So praise the Lord. If you, so if you're going to leave your laptop on the front seat when you park your car, put a Bible on top of it. So at least, you know, when they rob you, something good might happen. But it is, it is. The Word of God is powerful. When we hear the Word of God, when we speak the Word of God, when we know the Word of God, it's just like, it's a supernatural book. This book is just amazing. This book has been around for thousands of years. There's no other ancient book like the Bible. And I could do a whole sermon on series on that. But, I mean, just like the amount of texts that we have, the amount of the copies historically, just there is no other ancient book that compares. There is no other ancient book that's had so many different people creating one theme about the redemption of God. I mean, this is an amazing book that has supernatural power to transform our lives. And I think we have too many you know, because we're like, yeah, hey, uh, the Bible, that's cool. It's like scarcity would kind of help us understand how valuable it is. Like in China, they'd be like, like I gotta, I, this one page is going to get stolen from me, so I'm going to have to memorize it, and they can never steal it. Talk about hiding the word of God in your hearts, right? That's amazing. It's powerful. It's impacting. Somebody came up to me a few days ago, and they're like, Pastor John, that just the message on it is like inspired me. I'm, we're journaling together with the family, and we're reading the Bible together now. I'm like, yes! Because that's, I don't want to be like, uh, the last thing I ever want to do, I'm not trying to guilt people into doing things. That's dumb. It works for a week, and that's it. I want us to be like, to see the value in it, be inspired, and be like, oh, wow, that's amazing and awesome. It's not, it's never you have to do in grace, because we're in grace. We get to. We get to have this amazing Bible that we read and receive impartation from. Anyway, I don't want to re-preach it. That's supposed to be just the review, but I had some new stuff in there, so that's pretty cool. All right, so the next ingredient or component to revival is repentance. Oh, man. I hate that. We, yeah, I was like, oh, he's going to talk about repentance? Yeah. So, sorry. All revivals have repentance. All of them have this, like, like in, in, in the second great awakening, they had something called the anxious bench. And, and what it was, that was when altar calls started. Like, before that, you didn't have, like, after service, like, come up to the front and repent. Come up to the front and get right with Jesus. Come up to the front and get prayer right now. That's when that started, because people were just feeling such conviction. They're like, I don't want to wait to make an appointment with the pastor on Wednesday. I need to get right with Jesus today on Sunday. And they were doing it. In the Jesus movement, people were, like, bringing, like, drugs and, like, pentagrams and stuff associated with their past. And they were, like, putting it up on the altar and smashing it and be like, I'm following Jesus. It was, like, this expression. How many remember some of that? Some of you were there. You remember, like, people bringing up stuff and... They would just, like, destroy it, like Ouija boards and junk, and just, I'm destroying that. And they were following the Lord and repentance. Now, if you look at the word repentance, or in the Old and New Testament, there's actually several words that are used to describe it. You have, uh, in Hebrew, nacham, to be sorry, to console oneself, repent, regret, comfort, or be comforted. So that one can be used in a lot of different ways. Shuv is to return in the Greek, you got metaneo, metaneia, and those kind of talk about um, uh, just sort of like to um, think differently, to reconsider, to have a different way of understanding something, to repent. And so really, though, from the word, you can get all of those understandings. They really all encompass what it is to repent and turn back to the Lord. And so well, the first thing I want to say about repentance is... And just in the same way as, like, reading our Bible, this is not a bill we have to pay. It's not like, ugh, I got to go repent. This is a gift that we have because the bill has been paid. See, we can't repent good enough to get forgiveness. Jesus says when you turn and repent, you get forgiveness by receiving his gift of grace. I kind of think of it as like, like when I was a kid, I used to draw pictures for my mom. 
right? Anyone ever do that? You draw a little Crayola picture, and, like, you draw a person. And for some reason, I had a real hard time getting that head in the middle. Like, it would always be, like, on the shoulder, like, you know, just sitting there. You ever, you know what I'm talking about? Little kid drawing, and, like, the head's right there. And it's like, why, something don't look right about this, you know? And, but to my mom, it was beautiful, right? She didn't be like, oh, that head's way off in the wrong place. <laughs> now, my dad would sometime offer some constructive criticism, <laughs> but not my mom. To my mom, it was beautiful. And that's what grace is. Our works of repentance, God just was like, that's beautiful. That's wonderful. I'm excited about this. And so he, he accepts it, and it encourages us. And when we do it that way, it's kind of like, whoa, that's exciting. I want to I wanna repent more, right? I want to turn to him more, amen? It's a gift of new beginnings, I heard one time a preacher and a guy that I knew had, he was sharing that his kids had come back from a youth camp and, and really the, what he described wasn't a bad thing, but he put it in a bad way where they were, you know, there was a call for repentance and getting right with God and, and like, they were like, oh, we have to do this. We have to read our Bible and seek Jesus. And I'm like, and he's like, nah, you don't have to do that. It's just all grace. And I'm like, you didn't really say that right. Like, like, I don't, Jesus doesn't love me more when I pray and read my Bible. But I might love him more when I realize how great he is and I see him in his word. Um, I get transformed more. I become more like him. So it's not like, I have to do it so he loves me. No, it's like I get to because it's amazing. And so the grace, like, like when he said that, I was like, Ooh, that's telling the kids the wrong thing, you know. I mean, you, listen, it's all by grace. Grace is powerful. Saved by grace for good works. You know, grace empowers us to have this amazing transformed life. And all the time, we always fall short. We always don't do it just right. But you know what? His grace is there to lift us up and to put us back on track when coupled with repentance. Amen? Amen. So repentance is, is a great thing. Amen? Amen. It says in, in Titus 2.11, oh, well, fun fact, before I get to that, fun fact, so if, if, if uh, repentance seems like an Old Testament thing, the English word, the translated word for that is repentance or, or repent is actually in the New Testament twice as much as the Old Testament for the English word of it. So... That's a thing. <laughs> the New Testament's like this big compared to this much Old Testament. So, you know, repentance is kind of cool. It's still, it's still hip. It's still updated. <laughs> it's in the New Testament. And it's a lot easier to do in the New Testament because we're not under wrath, which is really cool. So first thing, though, we got to do is there's got to be like acknowledgement of guilt to accept our faults. You know, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we know that when we first get saved, we're like, yeah, all have sinned and fallen short. Yep, we've all missed the mark. But even as believers, there's still times when we are called back to those moments of repentance. We're still doing it. We're still realizing, hey, you know, I, okay. That's a problem. God doesn't do everything all at once, all the time. Sometimes he does some really big things when we get saved. But, like... And some people, like, experience transformation at different rates, you know. Some people have been saved 50 years and still working on some transformation and, and, and christ likeness. So there's, 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 everyone's at a different rate, and, and that's what grace lets us do, right? That's cool. I'm appreciative of it. Um, but this first part of kind of realizing that there's something there, I think our culture in a lot of ways, has kind of shifted on this, where, where, and I don't know, some, I could, you could maybe push back on this, it seems like people just don't want to be wrong more than ever, right, to say somebody's wrong is just like, it's like, no, I have my own truth, you know, but then sometimes I think, well, I've talked to some, some people that I've known for many, many years who come from a different culture, and I'm like, they ain't any easier to tell them that they're wrong, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? And so, you know, but I think maybe just it's a human nature thing. People don't like to be told that they're wrong, right? 
Well, even when they're told that they're wrong, well, the reason was. You ever have one of those apologies? You know why you don't like those kind of apologies? Because they ain't apologies, right? It's just like, well, actually, and then you're like, wait a minute. I just heard this, like, five-minute explanation apology. I think it's my fault now. <laughs> Joanna's husband's never done one of those, right? He never, <laughs> never. But the best one is just like, you know what? I, I was wrong, and I think my heart was in the wrong place, too. I did it because I was jealous. You ever, you ever get one of those, and you're like, I did it because I was insecure. <clears throat> Those are the best. Without explanation. And you know what I found? And this is just getting, and this is only like one little part. When we do that, I found that a lot of people are actually very gracious. Because we take down defenses. We take down walls. And when we take down walls, it's like, I told uh, my dad this. I was, it was my dad. And, and we were talking because... You know, he grew, let's say it this way, he grew in his ability to apologize. And we were having, we were having uh, a discussion before he passed, and, and there was an issue with somebody else, not me. And, like, he would give a long explanations about anything, but about apologies, too. And so, uh, and I had a great dad, by the way. It's not like my, I, have a, I had a great dad. I love him. But, like, his apologies would come with these long explanations. I'm like, Dad... That's not really an apology. That's, that's an explanation of why it's not really your fault. And I said, what you got to do when, when you apologize, is, and I asked him permission because I honored my dad. I was like, can I sh like share this with you, my opinions on this? Is this okay? And he gave me permission. So I was, I was very honoring to him. And he said, yes, go ahead. And so, and to his credit, like he received this. He was like, you know what? I received this. But I said to him, I said, I said, the apology is like this. A person with armor, and they're like, I'm sorry for this. And they have a sword, and, they, and it makes the other person feel defensive. And so it creates this thing, right? I said, think of apologizing as standing there in your underwear. Just be like, vulnerable. Don't do any defense. And you know what happens a lot is the other person will be like, you know what? Well, I was kind of harsh, too. And maybe I just, oh, thank you for that. I appreciate that. You know what? Uh, and just trust Jesus. Let Jesus defend you. If you feel like there was mitigating stuff, you know, it'd be all right. Right? It'd be all right. We don't, I remember, actually, I learned this at Gateway. I learned this at Gateway because I had, um, there was, uh, you know, if you've been at Gateway a long time, you remember there was, I'm not talking about Pastor Joe, there was some other toxic people in the in in the body and leadership that were here for a little season anyway and and it was very unsafe environment like it was like casting blame a lot of times and i didn't like that i felt very like nervous and secure and then finally i said you know what? i'm so sick of this and so i personally just was like if something was my fault i was like yeah that was my fault i didn't offer explanation i'm like sorry my bad even if it was like 40 percent my fault i was just like you know what? my bad i am sorry and i was like i'm gonna be the safe spot and I created, like, you know, and I remember the secretary at the time was like, you know what, uh, you know what, that was really, I should have done this. And then and I was like, oh, this is free. I'm like, go ahead, you know, they fire me, whatever, you know. I'm like, not worried about it, whatever they think about me, whatever. Okay, I don't care. They can think, oh, he messes up a lot. Okay, sure. Whatever. Because you know what, that's my source. That's the one that cares. I want to be that safe person. You know what? And so that's, that's a part of, of repentance is this, like, admission of guilt, admission of shortcoming, admission of whatever. And I don't mean just mental ascension, like, yeah, I'm kind of working on that. No, that's not what I mean. See, and here's how we know. See, true repentance has something in it. And, and true acceptance of guilt, you know what it has in it? Anguish. It has this, oh, man, like I feel like, mm, I do feel bad about that. Like I do feel like, I feel that heaviness from that. Mm, that's what you're looking for. And that's a tough one because, because, and I'll get to the good part, so don't worry. We'll get to the happy part. 
you know, because you're like, I don't like to feel sad. Yeah, that's, you know, people don't like feeling sad, right? And, but it's, it's a good and necessary part. And even mental health therapists will tell you people that avoid feeling any sadness have mental illness. You know, there's a, it's, it's a problem. And so, but then you're like, got in the same, on the other side of the coin, we got this society that is like struggling with all kinds of depression and stuff and anxiety. And we have the most wonderful things in modern society ever. And so I think there's, there's this, it's, it's part of the process, but it's not where we stay. Okay? Because when we get to that forgiveness part, he heals our broken hearts. He binds up our wounds. Amen? So it's just that part. It's, it's, it's on the way there. Amen? And so, like, when I first got saved, I started realizing some things. Like, I realized uh, with my little brother, I was going to, he was not yet following the Lord. We both grew up in Christian homes. We both were wild and not following Jesus. And so I realized I wanted to, I realized that I had been not always a good brother to him. And I remember one time I, I had, uh, I felt really bad about this, honestly, is I was like in second grade, we're at the bus stop, and the other kids were like saying, like, oh, your younger brothers, he's two years younger, he's, you know, so he's like in kindergarten or something, or first grade, and I'm in the next grade, and he, he's stronger than you, and like, I'm a dumb kid, and I'm like, no, he's not, and he's like, yeah, he is, and he's just standing there with his lunchbox, <laughs> not saying nothing, so you know what I did? I, sho- I feel so bad, I shoved him down. What a jerk. You got a loser pastor. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to find a new church because this one shoved his brother down in second grade. And so, you know, and then like, but like when I got saved, like I felt such sorrow for that. And like, I was like, and and a few other things. And so I went, you know, I said, I'm going to go buy him lunch. And, And we sat down and I was like, I am very sorry, you know, I want you, I did this and this, and I was not a great brother, and, uh, you know, I'm, like, getting all teared up, and he's, like, it's all right, it's okay, and he's saying, like, these good things that I did, but I wasn't, here's the thing, I, I wasn't, like, sometimes we're hoping for that, right, because we just want to jump right out of that anguish, but I was, like, no, I was embracing the anguish, I was, like, I really do feel sorrow for this, and I'm asking for forgiveness, and I'm expressing my fault, and I don't care. Like, I felt it like I don't, I didn't need it. You know, I just needed to repent. And he did tell the story when I beat up those two kids that were messing with him, so I was like, yeah, I did do that too. But, you know, (laughs) I, I did some nice things too. I wasn't all evil, but... You know what? He forgave me. A few months later, he came to the Lord. You know, I like to believe, like, God was doing all these things together, you know? And it was like, it's powerful. It's powerful. And I receive forgiveness. And you know what? I don't push him down anymore. Because he would kick my butt. I'm about the weakest boy in the family, you know? So I'm the one, the last one to lose in a fight. I got the mouth so I could start him, but, you know, start to back him up. <laughs> yeah, that happened a few times, but I got enough stories in this sermon already, so. You know, sometimes I do think, though, I think we're, like, praying for, like, these loved ones, and we're like, Lord, save them, Lord, save them. And I think the Holy Spirit might be like, you know what, go tell them you were a jerk and live different. If I had a mic, I could drop it right now. Boom, right? Like, like, like what if we let you know what? Yeah, I was a jerk. And, and sometimes I've still been a jerk, even though I'm sorry. And don't be like, because they tick me off when they do this. And no, just be like, you know what? Because God's not, God doesn't call us to behavior that's um, subjective to what other people do. You know that, right? Because Jesus wasn't like, oh, yeah, you know, they crucified me. So I, no, he's like, 
Ah, oh, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Like, this is like this exceptional, amazing love that he calls us to that's powerful. And so it's really great. And so I believe, like, when we show that and live that, they're like, it starts to, it does something. Think about that. Maybe some moms and dads. I know we've got all great people that don't do anything bad in here, but maybe somebody watching online, you know, one of you. But... uh it's powerful. It's powerful. Repentance can, can even change other people's lives. And, and there is a, there's a good anguish and a bad anguish. There's a, you know, like good grief versus bad grief. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. All right? So it's the difference between condemnation and conviction. Right? probably heard this before. Uh, now, both of these have some sadness with them. But one leads down to death. One leads to life. Condemnation, we're not condemned in Christ. He's forgiven us. You know, I'm still going to heaven. Even if I push Mikey down one more time, I'm still going to heaven. <laughs> It'd be like this. That's what it'd look like. I can't even wrestle my kids anymore. They're so big and strong. I, I used to be able to pin all three boys at one time. I'd be like a foot and this, and I'd be like, ah, ha, ha. and I'd get Boomer to come over and lick their face. I'd put peanut butter on them. I'd be like, ah, ha, ha. That'll be an interesting therapy discussion later. I don't know how that works. So, but, you know, it's, it's condemnation leaves us hopeless. Condemnation says, you blew it, you're an idiot, you're a failure, you'll never amount to anything. That's condemnation. Conviction says, you blew it. But I got a plan for you of redemption. This is a way out of that. There's a better way. There's have forgiven me. That's great. It just washed away. That's wonderful. Like, like, like Jesus, when, he caught the lady, when they caught the lady caught in the act of adultery. Remember that story in the Bible? And so these Pharisees, they caught this lady. We caught her in the act of adultery. Where's the dude? I don't see the dude. They caught the lady, and they're about ready to stone her. They're about to kill her by throwing rocks at her. Jesus walks to the pitcher. This is such a great one. You know this one? How many know this one? How many never heard it? All right, good. Good, that's cool. I'll tell it good. That's all right. Thank you for raising your hands. So, so Jesus walks up. They have rocks. They're about to kill this lady by throwing rocks at her because she committed a sin of adultery. Jesus walks up. He's like, hey. And, he goes, and they're like, we're going to kill her. He's like, hold on. Second, he starts writing in the ground. We don't know what he wrote. I think it was websites. And so he writes in the ground, and then he stands up, and he goes, whoever is without sin, you throw the first rock. And they're like, they read what he wrote. Maybe he wrote names. We don't, we'll find out in heaven. And so he's like, and they walk away, and they drop all their rocks, and they walk away. And he looks at this lady who was about to die who was condemned, who's probably weeping. She's like, oh, my God, I'm about to die. And he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. See, the false teaching of grace is, hey, it's okay. This is, it's not okay. But here's the path to life. Here's forgiveness that transforms. That's amazing grace. Amen? Oh, man, I love it. I love the way. See, that's how Jesus does it. See, when we do it that way, it makes people want to live different. You ever have somebody just tell you you're wrong and they just do it with condemnation? See, a lot of times condemnation is for something we were wrong. Right? A lot of times. But it's hard to receive because it comes mixed with anger and hate and not love and doesn't, and doesn't have redemption with it. I remember one time <laughs> we were at Life Church, and this wasn't like a sin, but it was, 
it, it, you know, believe it or not, this may shock you, but not every idea that I come up with is gold. <laughs> so we were meeting at a rec center. We were at Life Church was at a rec center, and and we had played. Uh, they had a ping pong table there, and someone opened it up. Yeah, ping pong lovers. All right, great. And uh, thank you for joining us today. And so. We had played some people, some guys were playing ping pong, and I noticed, oh, wow, this is great. They interacted really good, you know? And so I was like, yeah, let's, let's leave it out for in the back before service. People can kind of get together and fellowship and play some ping pong and stuff. Great idea. But uh, so we had some really wonderful, energetic children, and so... No more like could the adults get use of the ping pong table because kids, man, they got there fast. And their version of playing ping pong was whack this little thing as hard as you can and see how many walls it bounces off of. And so it got pretty pretty cray-cray. And I was like, oh, man, uh, you know, is this, you know, is this working? And there's one lady in the church who's like, Pastor John, this is terrible. We should not have that ping pong table. And you're just like, Rah! You need to get rid of that thing. And I was like, you know what that made me want to do? That made me want to put it in the front row. I don't do good with that. I don't just not receive condemnation. I stand on top of it and go, ah. Right? And so I was like, and then, so we kept doing the ping pong table for a while. And then we had this uh, retired pastor gift of grace and mercy, great, great guy, and he was attending the church at the time, and we, w- we would have coffee once a week, and he's like, hey, so let me, let me ask you, what's the, um, you know, I noticed you have that ping pong table there, and, you know, what's the, what's the, what do you, you know, what's the leading on that, what's the, what, how's that, what's the reason, how's the, what's the purpose of that, you know, and, and I explained it to him, and I'm all in, the, in my mind going, mm, I know it's kind of not working, and he's like, is that working? Is that achieving the goal you want? And I'm like, no, not really. Do you think we should get rid of it? He's like, I think maybe, you know, maybe, yeah, it might be better without it than, you know, because we're trying to, I think it takes away more than it gives. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. And so I got rid of the ping pong table. And it was quieter, and people could have their coffee and talk. And, and, and you know what? It was a good try. I'm, I'm, it's cool trying stuff. But the person that got me to change, which is what I'll get to where repentance is, the person that got me to change was the person that was gracious and loving and kind and didn't insult me to try to get me to change, didn't condemn me for, like, making a wrong. Listen, you know what? I like to be a place where it's safe to try something and fail. Go for it. Mess up big. Go and mess up. Mess up trying. Don't mess up like doing, you know, not trying. I don't like that messing up. I like to messing up trying something new and reaching and going. And, and you know, all right, cool, it didn't work. Let's try something new. I'll tell you the strawberry story, another strawberry outreach. Oof, that was a mess up. Never do strawberry outreaches. Anyway, save that for another sermon. <laughs> but what happens is when we repent, and one of the definitions is a new way of thinking. We see things different. There's a change of mind. And that's connected to that godly grief because when we realize, like, that's really bad and not good and not part of God's plan or whatever, we have that emotion of grief with it because we're thinking differently now, right? And so it's a different way of thinking. And that don't mean, like, just thinking, not, see, I think sometimes we just, it's not mental ascension again. It's not that. It's not like, oh, yeah, I think, yeah, now I think it is bad. I mean, I'm still cool with it and doing it, but, like, now I think it's bad. No, it's not that. It's like actually seeing it differently. Romans 12, 2 says this. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You ever just have, like, the way you think about something just suddenly change in, like, a minute? Like, you all of a sudden, you whoop. I remember one time I was working at Disney, and we had, we were standing at the front of the entrance to the, to the attraction, and you couldn't bring food in. 
So anyone that had food, you know, oh, finish it, stand to the side, and we'll, you know, let people in, and as soon as you're done, you can come on in. Well, one time we had this guy, and he's like this dad, and he's like big guy, he's got this tight t-shirt on, he's got, he's holding one kid, and they all got these big, tall ice creams, he's got another kid right there, and they got ice cream everywhere. It's hot, it's Florida, you know, ice cream melts in the heat, right? And so he's trying, and they, they're like looking like, uh, and he's like, it ain't keeping up. It ain't doing it. It's not working. There's ice cream dripping down their arms. It's all over his shirt. And so I do this because I'm a very kind and loving person. I look at my coworker. Thank you, Gary. Gary got the joke. <laughs> he, I look at my coworker, and I'm like, roll my eyes, like, kind of like, what a buffoon, right? And she looks, and she goes, that's a great dad. And I was like, I look back, and like in a moment, I'm like, I'm a jerk. (laughs) That's a great dad. Like I'm looking at a sloppy dude, right? She's looking at a great dad, and I see this dad who's like, his kids are giggling, and he's all a mess, and he's not worried about it. He's not yelling at them for making a mess. He's not worried about ice cream on the floor. He's loving his kids. He brought them to Disney. He looked like he didn't probably have like a ton of money, but he coughed up the money to take his kids to Disney. He's loving them. He's caring for them, and they're going to finish that ice cream and not throw it away because he's not embarrassed about his kids that he loves. What a good dad. And you know what? That was a good moment for me. You know what? Listen, it was good for me to realize I was being a jerk. Yeah. Right? I was. That, I don't feel, I don't, I'm not like, oh, well, I didn't really, oh, oh, oh. no. I was being a jerk. I was thinking, jer- that was an unsaved person that taught me the Christian at work was being a jerk. <laughs> good. Good, right? Good. I needed to know that because, you know why? Because that changed not just the way I saw that dad. That changed the way I've seen many, many dads and moms and people forever. I'm like, don't look at that. What, what, look deeper. And it's like, oh, yeah, this is so much. It changed my thinking. It changed my seeing, my perception. And that's a good thing. It's great when God changes the way we see life. You heard me talking about the word, right? I used to see it as a chore. It's something good Christians do. They read their Bibles. Good Christians read their Bibles. I tried to read my Bible like a good Christian, and I failed. For a lot of years. A lot of years. So don't feel, well, feel a little bad, I guess. But don't feel too bad because, you know what? Even like when you're already in the ministry, you can still repent and get right with Jesus and have transformation. And that's what happened to me. I realized I don't really love Jesus that much. And so I decided, you know what, I want to love you, Jesus. And, and, and as a part of that is knowing you. And so I want to pray to seek you, not to earn, but to love and to know. And so then I started doing it out of that. Not because that's what Christians do. No, not like that. It's what Christians get to do. And so now, my thinking, my perception, and everything about Jesus, and read, like, read my, my devotions, if you want to call it, my quiet time. It's not quiet, usually. I'm singing. But you know what? My, my thinking about that is not like something I have to do. Now it's like it's something I can't live without. If I'm on a vacation, if I'm on a trip, or whatever, I'm like, I want to be with Jesus at the beginning of the day because I love being with Jesus. Now, that doesn't, I'm not saying that to like, I'm not trying to be like, ooh, I'm spiritual. I, I'll tell you all my lousy stuff. I'll tell you the good stuff too, all right? That's fair. But it's great. It's fun spending time with Jesus. And if you're having a hard time, find some good coffee. That'll help. So, but, man, just, just do it to seek Jesus. And you know what? When it's, when it's by grace, if you're doing five minutes instead of four, it's grace. If you're doing 20, now, I, I won't lie. I do think, like, a little bit of time 
is something. I do think that, like, well, I, I, I'm with Jesus when I drive to work. Okay, that's how much that matters. But we got plenty of time for, like, watching them shows we never miss. You know, okay. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to, that's not a guilt thing. That's just like a, hey, you know, that's just a value thing. Seeking Jesus is amazing. People in revival seek Jesus. Amen? So what happens is we begin, when we start to think different, we go in a different direction. We change. That's repentance. Paul went from this guy that, like, terrorized the church, who terrorized the unchurched by leading them to Jesus. He's like, hey, I'm going to kill you if you're a Christian. And he's like, hey, guess what? Jesus died so you could be a Christian. You're like, what? Like, he completely changed directions. You know? And I remember one time when I was in Ecuador. We were in Ecuador, and they had this taxi strike. And all the buses and taxi drivers go on strike, and they would block off the roads. And they would just, they would, like, light tires on fire. And so what would happen is, like, people with pickup trucks would give people rides to help them out, and they would collect money for it. And and so, but if you were, had one of those trucks full of people, you would come to the intersection and they would, I, I walked up on one of these and I was watching this happen. There's like a mob, there was a mob of people there and they had sticks with nails on them and they would stop you and they would slash your tires, <laughs> slash all your tires. And so, and then they're like, hey, there you go. And they pull over. So there'd be all these like flat tire cars all over around the intersection is like, there was fire. I'm sure it's like much better now, but like that was what I saw happening. And, and so I was like, oh, this is crazy. And so I went to the next intersection and I'm like going to warn people. All the while I'm looking back, I'm like, they might like chase me. <laughs> like, like, I'm like, how far can I run? You know, I can run fast for like mm, 62 seconds, you know. I say, how far can I get, you know? And I'm like, so I'm like watching back there, and I'm flagging cars down. And I'm like, don't go this way. They're going to slash your tires. But I also, I'm not super great in Spanish. So I'm probably saying what sounds like, don't go this block. They break your tires, you know? It's probably what I sounded like. And they're like, huh? And so what happened was some people were like, thank you. And they turned. And some people were like, we're all right, and got their tires slashed. Yeah, I'm still in the same business. I'm like, turn, repent, there's a better path. This one leads to destruction. And, and that's why we, and we're the people, we're also people in the truck. And God is saying to us, that leads to destruction. This leads to life. Now, it's true with that real big turn in the beginning of coming to Jesus, but there's, there's all these little, little forks in the road we come through in life where God's like, you know what? That's the same path that you've been going on. Here's a little bit of a little newer one that's better. It's free from anger. It's free from hate. It's free from lust. It's free from this. It's free from that. It's, it's really a much better road. That one doesn't go to a good place. Some of them bad roads can circle back around complete wrong direction. You know, Joanna last week was talking about he was t she was talking about authority of walking in our assignment. See, but that's what that is. That's what repentance is, is when we turn. It's obedience. And we turn to follow Jesus, and we start walking in that. And that's when that authority comes on top of us. We repent of our own way and start walking in his way. And we see that mantle of authority come on us. See, repentance, it is a gift of grace. See, no sin is too big. It's... it's I, I got this quote, repentance is more than a moment of sorrow. It's a turning point that realigns us with God's will. Ooh, that's a good one, huh? That's, that's a good, that's good. We, we face our faults. These Marcos come up. And we, we got to admit it to quit it. You know, godly grief is, is evidence of repentance. You know, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. We start to think differently. You know, it's like putting a new operating system. You know, it's just a brand new way of thinking. And, uh, you know, it's like switching from iPhone to Android. The iPhone would be the sinful way, and then Android is the good way. Android nation. Just kidding. <laughs> so 
So, but we find this new direction. And it's not just turning from. It's not just that. We're really turning to. We're turning to Jesus. See, it's not just, see, and that's what it always is. It's not like, stop being bad. It's, it's turning to Jesus and having him in our lives. And we start to walk in our authority. We walk in his call. We walk in his plan. And that's why we need regular moments of repentance. Now, here's the best part. It says this, times of refreshing come from the Lord. When we first get saved, and every time we kind of like get that kind of course correction, you know what happens? The Holy Spirit whoosh, refreshes us. That's an actually uh, an, an ancient Greek medical term about just bring them outside and let them get that refreshing air that brings healing. We receive a refreshing of the Holy Spirit that rejuvenates us. Have you ever experienced that? You just, it's like you get it out. You're like, Lord, I'm sorry. I repent. I want to change. And you start to walk in it, and you feel this whoosh. That's amazing. That's freedom. That's power. That's the power of repentance. And it's grace. And it's great. And we can live that way and walk in greater, amazing power. Let's stand like that dad running out the door with the prodigal son, you know, and he's like, hey, that's what Jesus does every time we turn to him. Thank you, Jesus. Let's have the prayer team come forward. Lord, we just thank you for your presence. We thank you for your grace. Thank you for your anointing in this place. Lord, I just pray, and if you want, if you need prayer, come on up front. If you want to repent or, or anything, just come on up front. But, uh, Lord, we just want to live a lifestyle of repentance. Just ask the Lord. Just show me, Lord. Show me, Lord, where I need to course correct. Some things are big. Some things are little. We thank you, Jesus, for your grace that empowers us to live transformed lives. And I just pray, Lord, that we will be a people of repentance and we will see revival and renewal and awakening in this place. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Amen.